Welcome to this week's edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio, the weekly radio news magazine that goes into every possible issue that you could think of, because that's what the Virginia Institute for Public Policy is about. We're a do tank. I know you've heard the phrase think tank before. We're a do tank. So much of Virginia's legislation has started with folks like you and me at the Virginia Institute. Uh, I thank you for giving us some of your time. Our first uh, guest is is going to go into a topic we've covered before, American Commitment and their report on the AARP issues. Chris Jacobs, founder and CEO of Juniper Research and the author of that report. Uh, Chris, thank you for taking some time out with us this weekend. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. You know, this issue with AARP is in many ways certainly not as violent or as dire, but seems to be the same issues we see uh, in police uni- unions uh, and teachers unions. It's a union uh, that lobbies and doesn't necessarily do the things for its members it says it's going to do, but boy, it sure takes in a lot of money. Well, that's, it. that's exactly right. Um, AARP's Positions are incredibly compromised by their financial conflicts of interest, um, that they make more money selling products to their members and specifically selling health insurance to their members than they get from membership dues. And those revenues affect how AARP treats its members, and it treats its members in ways that violate its own stated policy positions and policy principles. Is there a case to be made that that violation, you know, substantively takes away some of the protections they uh, like to live under under this? Oh, we're just an organization. We're just, oh, you know, know, whoa, country doctor kind of thing. Uh, And and actually makes them, you know, as powerful as some of the oil companies or, you know, certainly the left likes to vilify NRA. I mean, if the NRA was actually selling guns, that would be <laughs> very applicable, but they don't. I mean, this this seems like uh, uh, that would be the kind of scenario that would be comparable. Well, AARP likes to claim whenever somebody brings the, the, these issues up that AARP is not an insurance company. And in the report, I, I say that is very true. An insurance company has to bear risk and can incur losses. Mm -hmm. AARP just can sit back and rake in foreclosed cash. They get 4.95 cents out of every premium dollar that its members pay for Medicare supplemental insurance policies. In other words, when they they want to charge you more money, because when they charge you more money, they make more money. What kind of, what how, what kind of consumer organization is that? Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, it'd be like a uh, car magazine that got a you know penny or a couple of pennies out of every Chevy that was sold, and then they uh, oh, hold it! They say these Chevys are really good. We should go buy more of them. And and it's if I remember correctly, it's uh, one particular insurance company has this deal with them, correct? Well, that's that's right. It's United Health Group. It's the nation's largest health insurer, uh, and they have received six hundred million dollars a year from United Health Group according to their most recent financial disclosures. And that number has grown over time. It's ironic that since Obamacare has passed in 2010, the amount of revenue that AARP has been getting from United Health Group continues to just grow, grow, grow. Which was predicted as they uh, began advocating for Obamacare, and uh, uh, sadly it didn't sound like all that many people were listening when we were making the case uh, that they were out uh, pushing for something that was going to actually make them money. Well, that's, that's exactly right. Their, their members were overwhelmingly opposed to Obamacare, saying, don't pass this bill, it's a big government bill, it raids Medicare to pay for a new entitlement. AARP supported it. Why? Because there were numerous carve-outs in the legislation for its, its Medigap cash cow. Ironically, Democrats have tried to talk about, oh, pre-existing conditions are a thing of the past because of Obamacare, there's no discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the one kind of health insurance that can still discriminate against pre-existing conditions is Medigap insurance, and AARP just so happens to have the largest market for Medigap insurance in the country. What about that? 
Well, and, and of course, their population, seniors, are, are the population. I was looking at some statistics that said they have the highest number of pre-existing conditions, and it's simply, in many cases, just from the fact that they're older than most other insurance company populations. That, well, that's exactly right. If you know, you you can get um, under under the law. You can you have six months after you turn sixty-five where you can enroll in any Medicare supplement plan without underwriting for pre-existing conditions. So you can enroll in an AARP plan, you can enroll in a Humana plan, whatever other kind of, of, of plan is out there. After those six months, you can't, you, you don't have that pre-existing condition uh, pr- mm-hmm. provision that, that if you have pre-existing conditions, your insurance company can deny you, they can charge you more, et cetera. So what keeping the pre-existing condition provision out of, of Medigap basically means AARP has the largest market share, and it will continue to have the largest market share because nobody will change insurance plans, and so you will buy that health insurance when you turn 65, and you will keep it until you die. It's basically a way for AARP to, to preserve their market power and their market share in this Medigap marketplace. You know, there's often been the expression, you know, uh, regarding things like socialism. Well, if it helped people, but it doesn't. And, and you know, I've had this debate with people in the past. It doesn't seem like AARP delivers on a lot of what uh, it promises. Uh, are people waking up to that, uh, Chris? Well, I hope so. Um, that's one of the reasons, frankly, why, why we wrote this report. Why, why we released this report. You can find the information on the American Commitment website. I have a lot of supplemental information and details on there. Mm-hmm. AARP's, some of AARP's own members have sued AARP alleging fraud because they are being charged this extra 4.95%. AARP doesn't tell its members about it, doesn't disclose this kind of stuff. They just go ahead and overcharge their members. And again, this is an organization that bills itself as a consumer advocacy group. How is any of that consumer advocacy? Well, if, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't there just a judge's ruling on this uh, in Ohio? There, there have been a couple of, of rulings on this. Some of the, the judges that have, have um, examined these cases believe, have ruled that, that state insurance commissioners have the proper authority and, and necessarily bring the cases in court. But it's also an area where, frankly, the insurance commissioners need to do a better job of mandating disclosure and mandating consumer-friendly transparency for AARP so that AARP has to tell its members, hey, we're overcharging you 5% here, and we have a financial interest to make your premium as high as possible because we get paid more for that. Yeah, didn't they? It wasn't their testimony. Like you know, they 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 said, "Oh no, you can't find you know you can't see that information. Uh, we don't have to disclose that because we're not a financial institution." Even though they go out and they uh, tell their members that they can act on their behalf like a financial institution. It's it's amazing the hypocrisy that comes uh, out of AARP uh, in this. Have they? And it didn't look like any of these cases were going anywhere. Is it a matter of writing the cases up better? I know you're not a lawyer per se in this, but uh, you know, from where you sit, does do the lawyers that are involved with these cases need, need to do a, a tighter job of of you know preparing these briefs, or is it just activist judges? And so I'm, I'm I'm not a lawyer, and, and I I don't want to go do, too far down. I think. Having read most of the, the the rulings here, I think the the one pattern is that the judges want to defer to state insurance commissioners and say that is a mm-hmm. process for the state insurance commissioner, and if the state insurance commissioner approves the rates, then the the rates are 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 approved. So I think it it behooves individuals and to go to state insurance commissioners and say why are you approving these rates. Why are you approving them when AARP isn't being a transparent organization? The National Association of Insurance Commissioners says if you have an insurance broker that gets paid on a percentage basis, the, the insurance broker should disclose to the consumer that I'm getting paid on a percentage basis. This is a financial conflict of interest and make sure the consumer is 100% aware of that. 
when I worked in the Senate several years ago, we asked AARP, do you abide by this National Association of Insurance Commissioners, this good practice? They wouldn't answer the question, which I think speaks, yeah. speaks for itself, the fact that they wouldn't answer this question. If they were being more transparent about it, somebody would say, hey, wait, this isn't what I expect from AARP. They're not treating me right, and they would go someplace else. Mm-hmm. Well, is there, I, I guess that's the, the substantive issue for a lot of seniors is they think they're getting something from AARP, uh, whether it be discounts or, or that kind of thing. And, and I wonder how much more of what AARP tells their members uh, that they're getting, uh, they're not getting. They're, <laughs> they're not getting the results or, or in some cases just um, paying to line the pockets of AARP. And I know certainly uh, none is more insidious than, you know, this Medicare bait and switch but you know how many other things are are they you know bought and paid for as just a marketing tool rather than an actual advocacy organization well that's the, the, you hit the nail on the head i think aarp from their financial statements about 18 percent of their revenue comes in from membership dues wow a majority of their revenue comes in from royalty fees, in other words, from selling AARP people stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's not, they don't make money really by, from the discount and giving out the discounts. They make money by selling more stuff to you. Um, and 38% of the budget of AARP's budget comes entirely from United Health Group. So think about that. They're more than twice as dependent on United Health Group for revenue as they are on their own members' membership dues. Well, that tells you they know where their bread is buttered. How do you think they are going to act in terms of, of, of their behavior when twice as much money comes from the nation's largest health insurer than it does from, from member dues? Well, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, that this is what the insurance uh, you know, overseers say is good practice. I mean, it's criminal if you do this in, say, the financial world. If, if you're acting as somebody's financial advisor and you're getting a commission from, you know, say, the Main Street Fund to put, you know, and so, yeah, you, you tell all your clients, oh, you should be in the Main Street Fund and you're getting a kickback from that. Uh, that's criminal. Is there, is there criminality in, in what AARP is doing or is it? really just regulatory you know it's it's i don't want to go too far into that because that varies state state by state frankly and okay. and and i'm not an attorney and so i don't want to go into specific state criminal statutes i do think it's 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 an unsavory business practice it's barely disclosed in the fine print if you watch on the tv ads you would have to know what you were looking for to even find any of these disclosures in the tv ads I, they don't tell their, their members that it's a percentage-based commission, the royalty fee that, 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 that they get for, for, um, for, for selling Medigap insurance. Mm. It's definitely an unsavory business practice. I think whether or not it's criminal or, or, or not is, is besides the point. If mm. it's a bad practice and you bill yourself as a consumer advocacy organization, why are you doing it in the first place? Chris Jacobs is founder and CEO of Juniper Research Group, uh, author of this report. You can find it at AmericanCommitment.org on AARP. It's called uh, AARP, How AARP Puts Profits Over Patients and Principles. Let me ask you this. You know, doing the research uh, into this and crunching the numbers are these numbers that you had to FOIA did you have to you know get a whistleblower i mean is it just so scattered out there that even if all this information is out there pulling it all together to look at it uh, you know would be herculean for the average uh, citizen so i appreciate you doing that but um you know is this a, a case where aarp is being intentionally obfuscating well, I, you actually raise a, a very interesting point. All of the data, they're, they're, AARP is not subject to freedom of information laws, uh, obviously, as a, mm. as a private organization. Um, most of the information was obtained from their financial statements and their Form 990 filings with the Internal Revenue Service that all nonprofit organizations are, are required, required to file. It is interesting, though, their most recent financial statements for 2018, which they filed last year, 
mm-hmm. specifically obscured the percentage of revenue that they get from United Health Group. And that was the first time in over a decade that they did that. Really? Um, that they did not outline how much money they are getting from United Health Group. And it shows how compromised they are as an organization and how they do not like this scrutiny. The fact that they removed that information from their financial, uh, from their annual um, financial reports. That should be telling to anyone who's a member. Uh, is this also, and, and I think we spoke to Phil Kirpin from American Commitment a few weeks back about this, and, and he might be better suited uh, for this question. But on the subject, I mean, it doesn't strike me as somebody who's now old enough to join you know, an organization like AARP, um, I look at it and I say, well, I can get all this stuff elsewhere. I mean, I don't need you to get me this stuff. I, I, don't, I, I don't see the point, I guess, is what I'm saying. I, you know, it, and maybe that's their bigger fear is that eventually Americans are going to wake up and say, I don't see the point of AARP anymore. Um, and and maybe that's the, you know, the message that needs to go forth from this place is that uh, that you'll really look at what you're getting and what it's costing and, and are you benefiting from it? Well, exactly. What, what is the point? I think what they try to do is, is lure people in with the discounts, and it's a low membership, and if you spend $10 a year on membership, but you say $50 on a car rental or a hotel bill, you say, oh, that's great, I've saved all this money. The problem is, once they get you in with the discounts, then they try to sell you other stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's where they make all their money, is by selling people other stuff. Their royalty fees have more than tripled in in the past decade or so. Um, It was even, in terms of of the the amount of money they got from membership dues and the amount of money they got from royalty fees, the amount of membership dues, money, the the dues money has has stayed relatively constant. The royalty fee money has gone through the roof. They just keep trying to push AARP. So really what you're doing is you're joining into an organization where they they try to pressure you to buy stuff. It's like joining a timeshare pitch, basically, Mm -hmm. going going to a timeshare pitch where they try to sell you more stuff. Yeah. Well, as a, I guess there are 501c4, like any other you know, uh, fraternal organization like a Chamber of Commerce might be or, uh, organized in that way. But that gives them nonprofit status. So where does all this money, what do they use all this money for? Is it just salaries? Are they, you know, are they investing? Is it, is it money, money circling? I don't, I want to, don't want to use the L word, but, you know, is this money going back into other organizations as uh, forms of tribute, let's call it? Um, I, you know, they've built a, a very big empire for themselves. They have a palatial headquarters in Washington, D.C. costs a couple hundred million dollars to build that the members can't even enter. I've, I've, I've read articles years ago where an AARP member tried to go in the AARP headquarters. They said, no, you can't get in without an appointment. We won't let you in. Um, they, they pay staff. You want to take a guess what the average staff salary is? For AARP? Oh, I'm afraid to find out. Now I need to know. It's about $175,000 per year. Holy cow. Nice work right. if you can get it. it that, that's exactly right. So it's not just that their CEO makes a mil, over a million dollars a year. It's their average salary compensation is $175,000 a year. So compare that to what the average senior makes on Social Security or a pension, if they're lucky enough to still have a pension. Or what, what the average American is, is making in, in, in this economic downturn. I don't make $175,000 a year. This is nice. As, as you said, it's nice work if you can get it. But where does all that money come from? It comes from overcharging seniors and getting seniors to buy insurance products that they may not even need. Right. It's it's amazing considering what you know you know these are uh, in many cases a community that's on a fixed income uh, and worrying about you know their property taxes and things like that being forced out of their homes it kind of kind of gets offensive when you think about it. Yeah, it, it's preying on on vulnerable seniors and the vulnerable elder, elderly, and to build yourself as a consumer advocacy organization when you're trying to bilk people out of out of money. To, to, to pay for your Taj Mahal, you know, office suite there, it, it, it seems unconscionable to me. 
Oh, absolutely it does. And thank you so much for chronicling it. Chris Jacobs, he's the founder and CEO of Juniper Research Group, worked with American Commitment. Uh, that's where you find this report on AARP uh, and its profits over patients and principles. Uh, I really appreciate this work and, uh, you know, support what he does, juniperresearchgroup.com. Uh, find out more about the stuff they're doing there. Chris, I, I really appreciate what you've done here uh, and laying it out. And we'll share it out with as many people as we can uh, get heard. And uh, maybe they'll start asking those same questions. Thanks for having me. Coming up next on Freedom and Fro Prosperity Radio, gee, this couldn't possibly be an important topic either. Uh, the Honest Elections Project, Jason Sneed, is going to join us to talk about voting in the pandemic and in general. We'll get into that next on Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Freedom and Prosperity Radio.